coronavirus pandemic has brought the vulnerability of rural populations to light. In general, it's hard to staff rural areas. We don't have a lot of funding. We just don't. One of the hardest hit regions per capita is the Navajo Nation in the remote Southwest. Some of these families are the high risk patients. They're asking for masks and they're asking for gloves, but we don't have enough to go around. For decades, the broken promises made by the U.S. government have made life on the reservation a struggle. The first citizens of this country are still sitting in poverty, but we're not gonna feel sorry for ourselves. It is up to us to take care of ourselves. Will COVID drive the Navajo closer to the brink? Are you scared? I'm scared for our culture. And there's not many of us Navajo people remaining. Or start a rallying cry to finally get the relief that's long past due. They say, all these tribes are gonna get wiped out. I was like, heck no, we're still here. Any other crisis we've experienced. At this point, uh, COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans with many, many more likely to perish. But it isn't just happening in urban centers like New York and Los Angeles. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. It isn't driven necessarily by population density. There's hardly anyone out here. The Navajo Nation, home to over 170,000 people, is roughly the size of West Virginia and runs across three states in the Southwest. Despite its relatively low population density, as of early May 2020, the region has a higher coronavirus death rate than that in 46 states. The Tuba City Regional Healthcare Corporation serves an area of over 6,000 square miles. And with a shortage in nursing and specialized medical staff, the most critical patients must be airlifted to hospitals outside of the reservation. Hi, Dr. Tom. Yes. Hi, Adam Yamaguchi with CBS. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. So nice to meet oh, you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Have you, have you here? One of these days we'll be able to shake hands. <laughs> This is our ambulance entrance into urgent care. Mm -hmm. It is urgent care, but lately it feels like an ER. Um, an ER Dr. Michelle Tom grew up in Navajo Nation. She recently relocated to this urgent care clinic, an outpatient facility that transfers cases requiring 24-hour care. Out of an abundance of caution, we were only allowed in before patients arrived for the day. So, right here is our actually first trauma room. Uh, well, because everything's going on, we've had to make another additional one to set as best as we can with our limited supply. So is this, where's your car? Uh, it is this one right here. Ah, okay. You, you probably have to live out of your car, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so with the help of my brother, um, I kind of compiled my own set of PPE. Uh, this one's a full one with the head um, and the boots. Okay. So um, that was a great find. Um, I felt like I had the jackpot on that one. You've amassed this all on your own. <laughs> yeah. Well, for your protection and for the protection of your patients. Absolutely. Yeah. And even my colleagues, you know, I have to be careful being around them. If one physician's down, uh, one nurse is down, that's longer waits, less uh, care for our patients. You and the people that rely on you cannot afford to go down. No, no. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. So. We have to do everything we can just to stay healthy. Winslow Indian Healthcare Center is one of five private nonprofit hospitals serving the Navajo Nation. But it faces staffing and personal protection equipment shortages other COVID-19 epicenters have also experienced. In general, it's hard to staff rural areas. And now we're having to try to find these professionals of nurses and doctors because they're pulled everywhere now across the country. 
So, you know, we don't have a lot of funding to lure some very experienced doctors and nurses and medical staff. We just don't. By and large, what would you say the baseline health of, of the Navajo people is? We, we do carry a high rate of diabetes, you know, hypertension, uh, what we call metabolic syndrome that incorporates those two things. And per capita, we actually have the highest rates. The highest rates in the continental U.S.? Yeah, yes. So in some ways, it's, it must not come as a surprise to you that, that Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yes. It makes us vulnerable because the more we lose our elders, um, which they're at high um, susceptibility to COVID-19, is that they're our teachers, uh, our protectors, um, our providers of our language and our way of life. So we want to protect them as much as possible, um, keep them safe. And so if we don't have that anymore, you know, who are we as a people anymore? Traditional Navajo lands spanned an area far larger than the present-day reservation. In its campaign for westward expansion in the mid-1800s, the U.S. slaughtered Navajo livestock and poisoned water in hopes of seizing the territory. These efforts culminated in forcing over 11,000 Navajo people from their ancestral land and onto a violent 300-mile journey to a prison camp where they were detained for four years. Once released, they entered into a succession of agreements with the U.S. that gave them sovereignty over their land, but with promises of support and aid from the U.S. federal government. Many of those promises have gone unfulfilled. We are awaiting patiently for the resources to come in from the federal government. What do you say to those who say, you're a sovereign nation, figure it out yourself? Well, look at the states. All 50 states are sovereign entities as well. And we agreed through a treaty that we would help each other both ways. And we have always honored that agreement. And so when we signed the treaty, we gave up some lands. Uh, but there was a promise made that the federal government would help with health care, education, and many others, infrastructure. Recently, Congress passed three relief packages for tribal communities like Navajo, but the $8 billion must be shared between 574 federally recognized tribes across 37 states, as well as for-profit Native Alaskan corporations. You know, these direct dollars that are coming in from the federal government should go directly to the, the, the citizens that are directly impacted, correct? But not here on Navajo, not here in tribal communities. They go to a federal agency, they get passed through there before it comes to the citizens uh, of the tribe. We've been in this pandemic here for, in, in this country for uh, months now. And these bills that were approved by Congress, uh, you know, three bills that were approved uh, didn't just happen recently. It's been some time now, but we haven't seen much of that money go into Indian country. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water not just water, infrastructure, electricity, broadband. We don't have the best internet access. And all we want to do is just to be at the same level as everybody else throughout this country. But this highlights that the first citizens of this country are still sitting in poverty. Due to scarce funding and the constant struggle for water rights, an estimated one of three residents lacks access to running water. The average American uses 88 gallons of water per day. Many of these residents have to get by on a fraction of that. Our, our access to water comes with great effort. You know, we are in a climate where it's dry. Um, I grew up in that realm where we, my grandmother had, you know, little tanks and we'd siphon. It. I remember as a kid siphoning it <laughs> into um, a bowl so I could wash up for today. And we used to travel to, to get water from the well. Yeah. This, is the that that comes comes down. this is where the Eskies live, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Dilcon Chapter House is the administrative center for the community. 
Members have gathered to determine how they're going to bring water and supplies to elderly residents during the pandemic. And how many people live within the uh, chapter? Our last survey showed we had um, 1,100 plus. Mm. The, the red dots indicate where the water, where they don't have running water. So oh wow, that's a lot. Uh -huh. you know, take a Margie lot Barton is the Dilcon chapter easy. coordinator and Dr. Michelle Tom's aunt. So if people come all the way out here to pick up water, how often are they having to do this? I noticed that some families, mm -hmm. the more people in the household, they come every week. And the ones that are maybe two, three, they come on a maybe two week basis, but they fill their tank. Some of them have like um, 2,100 gallon tanks. Some oh. of them have the 1,500 um, cisterns that's in there. Uh -huh. But the ones that don't have any type of system like that and depend may mainly on their bug barrels, they come on a regular basis. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. So the, the lack of a truck, is that's got to hit people pretty hard, oh, definitely. especially now. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. the distance is far. And the thing is that it's just not a one, um, one family household. These are multiple families that live in one household. So we have a listing of, of all the elders that live in this Delta area. Uh -huh. And we have other um, community health um, workers that are on the phone, even now as we're speaking, mm -hmm. calling all these individuals and asking them if they have enough firewood, if they have enough water, food, pellets for heating, whatever that they need, propane, PPE, if they need water hauling, Cough syrup, whatever that food. they need is what we're compiling the list on. Uh -huh. And based on that, and they purchase the items and we go back out and we deliver them. hard to imagine how Navajo Nation has been hit so hard considering that the population is so sparse. Much of the population far, far off the main highway. We've been on this dirt path for like an hour. Came upon this. It's functioning well. I'm told that a good chunk of the population here, they don't have running water in their homes. They've got to come out here and pump their water. Some of the most vulnerable residents aren't able to make the drive to the nearest store. The matriarch of this family, whose grandmother experienced the deportation and resettlement of Navajo here, is 114 years old. They have water in that, that 350 gallon water barrel and then also the water barrels. So they haul water that's for like, to take a shower for potable, to clean the house, to wash our hands and stuff like that. Then we deliver water to them uh, every week. They're probably rationing that, just only using what they need, probably less than maybe two, three gallons a day. Uh, if they become infected, that's one of the things that they're most afraid of is if they come and become infected, especially the ones that um, go to dialysis, the ones that are diabetic, high blood pressure, those are the ones because their immune systems are weak, like the ones that go to chemotherapy. Some of these um, families or some of the individuals, the high risk patients, they're asking for masks and they're asking for gloves, but we don't have enough to go around. We got Beatrice, Lucy, <laughs> my cousin Kevin lives up there. And then my uncle Edison and them live over there. And behind the red hill with the white top, that's where my uncle um, Christopher, my aunt um, Joanne live, their brother and sister, they live there. What sort of services have stopped as a result of COVID? For us down here, it'd be like uh, the transports, medical transports that take you to your appointments. So w what sort of medical treatment was your was some of your family members um, seeking? Um, my cousin over across the way and all, she has to go in for dialysis. And now we all have to coordinate who's going to go to Winslow so she can get her dialysis. 
I'm surprised because I would think that, you know, transport for people who are seeking dialysis treatment would be kind of an essential service to keep providing during this time, but you're having to do it yourself. Yeah, we, down here in the valley we do. We all depend on each other now. Like many rural communities, the Navajo face other factors that contribute to high rates of health problems in the region. According to the USDA, the vast majority of the Navajo Nation is a so-called food desert, which is an area that has limited access to fresh, nutritious food. There are only 13 grocery stores in an area equal in size to Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts combined. When I ask people what I should eat here, the first thing people say is fry bread. You've got to try the fry bread. It's basically fried dough. This is a food that uh, the Navajo people have really come to enjoy. It's, it's become a staple, but it's also a food with a really complicated legacy. Um, many, many years ago when the Navajo were rounded up from their ancestral lands, essentially put into camps, uh, their food was taken away from them. Their agriculture was taken away from them. They were given by the U.S. government salt, sugar, flour, and lard. And they had to figure out how to how to make do with that, and they came up with, with this, fry bread. As we drive around Navajo Nation, we come across a lot of gas stations selling snacks, a lot of fast food. This is a food desert to the extreme. Like many Native American communities, the Navajo culture is rooted in living off the land. Farm plots dot their landscape throughout the reservation, but many of them lay dormant. You can see the baby seedlings. Some hemis, chilies, and Patagonias. And those are the baby starts. Oh, look at this, we got strawberries down here. Yes, but you can see the, the garlic in here is just doing amazing. Tyrone Thompson is a Navajo master gardener, activist, and educator. He's been working with local Navajo families to bring dormant farms back to life. Integrating in the indigenous knowledge with modern techniques and new teachings and you know just doing our best to absorb all of the knowledge and and, and, and give back to the community. And we have we have we have enough water, we have a high unemployment rate, so um, sustainable agriculture and regenerative agriculture is the way to go for us. We are under the Chosh O oh, is considered the Ramada or shade house for the for the farm where we gather for our harvest fest and our spring activities as a uh, farmer orientation. Okay, and we're surrounded by a number of, of, of farm plots here. Yes, about 30 farm plots on a hundred acre farm on the far southwest portion of Navajo Nation. Seeing the health disparities of people out here on, on Navajo Nation and in, in other countries like Hopi, I felt the need to help. Now, what, what is responsible for the health disparities that we see here? Um, we are dependent on the U.S. government for, for commodity foods, and bleach flour, bleach sugars, and we've kind of adopted those foods and have disconnected ourselves from the traditional foods that we were accustomed to growing and enabled us to live long, healthy lives. I think people are hungry for a lot of this information. Reconnecting to our roots, reconnecting to culture, um, understanding where we're coming from and going back. Um, and it's, it's very important because that's it's therapeutic and, it's, and food is medicine. My kids are eating kale chips and they have no problems eating you know, salads on a daily basis. And, and, we've, and through this crisis, we've been able to harvest on a daily basis enough for our family and our, our workers as well. I think as a whole, we are all healing in a process of healing as well as reclaiming our health and, and uh, wellness. I think that's the shift that's happening here on the Navajo Nation. For many years, we've been being stewards of the land. And here on the Navajo Nation, we have seen broken promises, yes, but 150 plus years ago, we were self-reliant and self-sufficient on this land. And I think because of what's happening now, people are realizing now's the time to step up. Now's the time to become self-reliant, self-sufficient as our ancestors were before we signed that treaty.
Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez reached out to the federal government, requesting preemptive aid weeks before the first COVID-19 case was diagnosed on Navajo Nation, but assistance never arrived. Now, grassroots movements are stepping in and helping communities across the nation, from installing hand washing stations, fundraising, to food drives. Despite the fact that this is a very small town, the turnout has been pretty impressive. I'd say there are probably about upwards of 100 or so cars, 100 families that have turned up for uh, boxes of either free supplies or free food. We're not going to feel sorry for ourselves because there's no federal resources coming down. It is up to us to take care of ourselves, and that's sovereignty at the highest level. Congratulations, guys. Good job. I'm so proud of you all. Uh, you guys did awesome. You guys be blessed many times for helping your citizens here. We overcame, like I said, through these tough times. We went through the long walk. We came back into our four mountains, right? And we're still here. No matter what happens through this pandemic, right? We're gonna still be here. No matter what those guys say, they're gonna, they say, all these tribes are gonna get wiped out. I was like, heck no, not us. We're overcomers, we're strong. So let's pray, let's close in prayer. Um, I was gonna say hold hands, but six feet, I don't know. All right, let's pray. We are a strong people. We are. Um, and I think that's what I'm most proud of. Uh, but when you see a, a brother or sister, you know, kinship, and they're asking for help, and there's not much more you can do for them. Are you scared? I would be human if I said I wasn't. Are you scared for you? I think I'm scared for, of course, from, for me, but it's bigger than me. Um, I'm scared for our languages, um, our culture, our people. You know, I know it's happening all over, around the world. I, I get that. I, I understand that. You know, my time is limited on this earth. It is. Um, but our language and our cultures can continue to live forever as long as there are people, there are Navajo people. And I think that's what scares me the most. And I think that's why I, I do what I do. Do your parents tell you that they're proud of you? <laughs> they do. And I'd seen my mom for the first time, in, like in person, um, for like three and a half weeks now. Wow. <clears throat> Our deal was like, you're gonna stay in the truck. Um, but, uh, so first time in three and a half weeks that you yeah. saw your mom? Yeah. Is that heavy? Um, What'd she say to you? <clears throat> and she, <clears throat> sorry, I apologize. Um, she just be my mom. She's like, hey baby, how are you doing? Um, and that's enough to like, just fill every part of me, so. But I don't show it, you know, can't show it. I got to make sure that she knows I'm okay. So then she's not worrying about me. But they don't stop worrying. No, I don't think parents ever stop worrying. Hello. It went off. It went off. <laughs> Hello, sister. This is Margie. Um, we were just calling to see if you could come over. It's not working. You know, we came out here to uh, try to put a face to the forgotten members of society. So many people out here who don't have access to FaceTime or Zoom. As we've been robbed of our most base modes of expression, our instinct to get close to one another, to connect. We can't do that right now. We can't run the risk of going out, potentially spreading the virus to people who don't have the defenses to deal with this, but they're out here. Where does Navajo Nation go from here? 
I hope the attention that it's getting nationally will have our Congress and administration help more than they have in the past um, so we can get more access to healthcare and infrastructure, water, plumbing, electricity, education. We gotta keep our distance system. We're never, we're never. <laughs> we had our sign. Yeah. Oh, yeah. These are huge issues that have been going on for so long. It's not gonna happen overnight. But I am hopeful, we have a, we are, our community strong. Hello, sweetheart, this is your mommy. I miss you so much, I love you. Hope to see, see you soon and be safe, baby. And we're getting there, you know, slowly but surely. Hopefully in my, my lifetime, it'll change. Hey, thanks for checking out CBS and Originals on YouTube. If you want to watch more documentaries, download the free CBS News app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or any streaming device. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here. Thanks for watching.